It'll make you laugh. It'll upset you. But most importantly, it'll make you think. This is Dogma Debate with David Smalley. Welcome to Dogma Debate. As always, I'm your host, David Smalley, and I've got a great show planned for you. In just a few moments, we're going to be talking with former apologist and former assistant, personal assistant, to the great Josh McDowell. Uh, His name is Dustin Lawson. You're not going to want to miss this. Um, He traveled around with Josh McDowell all over the country, in fact, I believe all over the world, Uh, and, and we're going to be talking with him in just a few short minutes. Also, my debate with Matt Slick is going to be October 1st in Arlington, Texas. It's at a place called Sherlock's Pub. You can go to Sherlock'sPub.com, click the little drop-down menu, and select Arlington as your location, and that's where you're going to get to find the address. It's 254 Lincoln Square Center in Arlington, Texas, Um, and that's going to happen October 1st around 6 p.m. Get there, and we're going to have a blast together. The following night... So that's Saturday night, October 1st. The following night, October 2nd, Matt Slick is going to stay in town, and he's going to be be debating Matt Dillahunty uh, in Dallas on October 2nd. So October 1st, it's versus me. October 2nd versus Matt Dillahunty. So um, as I understand it, he's got a whole film crew coming with him and all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, that's going to be a whole lot of fun. You can check out more information at thebibleandbeerconsortium.com or follow them on Facebook, Bible and Beer Consortium. Thank you to Ezra and all the wonderful people over there for making all that happen. So stay tuned in just a moment for Dustin Lawson, the former apologist. But right now, I want to welcome back one of our good friends of the show, Ladies and gentlemen, the captain, Jerry D. Witt, is right here on Dogma Debate. Hello, Jerry. How are you, sir? Hello, brother David. I am doing well. It's so good to hear your voice, man. I, I haven't talked to you in a while, and I, damn it, we just miss you, Jerry. We miss you. I, I miss you, too, David, and whenever I listen to you making your announcements and talking about all the plans that are coming up, it really kind of intimidates me and makes me feel very fortunate to even be here with you right now. Oh, stop it. That's just... You've just grown so immensely. It's like you're two or three inches taller than me now. <laughs> I'm very, very intimidated. I think I've always been two or three inches taller than you, Jerry. Oh, no, bull. No <laughs> way. Forget it. Forget well, it. Uh, hold on. Are you, ca- are you counting the hair? If you're counting the hair, then I'm out. Why do you think the hair exists? That's the only reason that I have it. It's as a distraction and to create a little, uh, little bit of a, you know, advantage. <laughs> Love it. So um, you're doing a really cool uh, podcast now with Bobby Carey of No Religion Required, uh, one of our dear mutual friends. Um, and I don't think my listeners have really been been in on what's going on. So let's tell them what you and Bobby have been up to. Well, first off, let me say the reason I'm doing this show with Bobby is because you never would ask me to do anything. I hinted around. I petted on you. I left little notes on your car. I sent you emails. I sent you birthday presents, Christmas presents, everything that I could do to flirt and flatter and try to get closer to you. But yet you just would not take the hint. So Bobby came along, and I went for it. You know, it's funny. Bobby's going to love love this, and I can just hear him now. He, he's going to he's going to say, "Oh, I see how it is. I'm just playing second fiddle." That's what. That's how he's going to word it. You know that. He already he already thinks that he's Ed McMahon and I'm Johnny Carson <laughs> on the show. But well, look, it's I mean, actually you, just the opposite. Look, we we you know I I don't think I've ever had more fun with anybody in this studio than when Jerry DeWitt is in studio. And the, the listeners love you being here. I would love for you to be more involved with Dogma Debate. You know my rule, though, man. I have that one that one rule no. about Dogma Debate. You just, you got, I, you got to be, you got to be in person. You got to be in studio. And I just don't want to do a, an over-the-phone show. That's my, that's my thing. I, even, I'm so strict with the rule, I'll even bypass on the great and wonderful Captain Jerry DeWitt. But you guys are doing a great job with it. I mean, it's it sounds really good, and you guys have really good chemistry. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be it's, part of the first episode, and I'm I'm digging it, man. I'm loving what you guys are doing. Well, you got us off to a fantastic start, letting us do the first episode in the Dogma Debate studio. 
and it's just been a steamroller ever since. I absolutely love the show. I'm not exaggerating when I say I love doing the show so much that I really don't feel compelled to do anything else. I'm going to do Skepticon you know, at the end of this year. I canceled on two other conventions that I was going to. I don't have any conventions planned next year. I am totally satisfied and into the Hope After Faith podcast. That's so cool. Now, it's, people can find it on Spreaker. They can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, all those other places, right? Yes, sir. They sure can. It's a, it's a part of the secular media group that you are the captain of, and we're very honored and proud just to have our little small part. So, so tell everybody, like, what's the what's the focus? What do you hope to accomplish with Hope After Faith as a podcast? Now, that's the the original title. That's the title of your book. What, why do you feel it's necessary to bring that into podcast form? Is it something that just there's just so much more to talk about than what you left off in the book? Absolutely. Anybody who has heard me rattle on knows that um, me and my co-author Ethan Brown were only given four months to write Hope After Faith. And we had to be very, very choosy as to what we put into the book. Not only was it limited time, but obviously limited space. And so we just skimmed across the top of a lot of important, not just important stories, but important issues. So the podcast gives Bobby and I the opportunity to dig deep into some of these transitional points, some of these issues that are important, regardless of which side of the fence. And you know me, I don't feel like I'm on one side of the fence or the other. I feel like I'm above the whole dang yard. I've graduated from my religion, not lost my faith. And so it just gives us a platform every week to go as deep as we possibly can about issues that some people, not everybody, but some people find troubling or challenging as they're moving out of faith into the secular world are, are just almost really any kind of transition. We actually dealt with how to deal with your biggest fears a couple of episodes back, and it was probably one of the funnest episodes that we've had so far. We've done crazy things like tell funny church stories. Uh, we had a whole episode just on exorcisms. So it's just a great opportunity to use the book as a jumping-off point, but to just deal with life as deeply as we can. That's one of those things, kind of like with the way dogma debate is, is, is I guess, structured and, and titled. Um, it doesn't have to only be about specific Christianity. You know, it doesn't have to be about atheism. That's why, you know, I, don't, I, I never mention my show as an atheist-based show. It's a, it's a skeptic-based show. We, we go after dogma. And guess who has dogma? All of us, uh, Democrats, Republicans, Everybody. Libertarians, Independents, whether you're religious or atheist, there are parts of, of your life that you just accept and believe and hold strong and fast to. And that's kind of the same way with faith. This thing, you know, people can have hope after Muslim faith. They can have hope after Hindu faith. They can have hope after coming to atheism for the wrong reasons. Even some people, yeah. some people will become atheists for the wrong reasons. Uh, Matt Dillahunty and I had a, a whole conversation about that. And he's like, I don't want people to convert to atheism because they misunderstood an argument. You know, the atheism isn't a religion to convert to. It's not even a worldview. It's an answer to one question. And what do we do after that? What happens after that? And I think a lot of believers are really just terrified. They, they don't know what happens if their faith uh, were to go away. And so providing this platform to say there is hope after this and then you guys digging into this I think is one of the most valuable things our our movement can offer. It's a lot of fun. It allows me to address a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is, yes, atheism is not and cannot be a religion, but that doesn't mean that a secular person can't handle their new worldview religiously. Mm. And if you've come out of fundamental religion, you don't always even know how much you're still religious. <laughs> and, and Dar- you know what? A different sub- Look, Daryl talks about that with um, with uh, this whole sex and God concept and his secular sexuality right. podcast. Uh, secular sexuality, he, he div- dives into that and goes, you don't realize how many atheists still hold on to these religious ideologies when it comes to their sex life or shame or slut shaming or or all of these little things creep up out of our religious background. And look, I was thinking the other day about some stuff you've said before when, you know, all, all this stuff was blowing up and, and 
you know, when we did that podcast together about, you know, sort of some of the drama going on behind the scenes, I remember you saying this isn't a, a lot of the problems we look at churches and say, oh, those religious people act this way. That's atheists succumbing to group psychology, saying we're the right ones, they're the wrong ones. Um, we're doing it right, they're they're doing it wrong. And you said it's not a religious problem, it's a people problem. You take a group of That's atheists right. and you take a, a handful of atheists and you split them up into groups and give them limited resources, there's going to be corruption. because Not because they're atheists, but because they're human beings. You know, I know we've only got like a minute left in this segment to wrap up, but I, I wanted to give you a chance to, to address that and, and how, how you both, you and Bobby, plan on addressing that kind of stuff moving forward, too. Sure. Thank you for this opportunity. And the bottom line is if all of the human beings disappeared out of the universe, there would be no religion because religion is not a thing unto itself. It is the byproduct of the human experience. So we take the opportunity every week to dig deep into the human experience, trying to make sure we weed out all of the religious after effects out of our own lives in a funny, humorous, very naked and raw way. And it gives us a little more hope every time. Now, when you get naked, is that when you realize Bobby has all those equipment issues? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's some areas that are two-thirds of what I thought they were going to be. Um <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> and anybody who's keeping up knows exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah, naked, naked makes it a lot funner. It's a little sweatier, a little stickier, but it's always better oh, for the audience. Oh my God! Right, and that's all the time we have for Jerry Dewitt, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Jerry, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it, man. Love you and yours. Coming up next, Dustin Lawson, former Christian apologist and assistant to Josh McDowell, right here on Dogma Debate. If you're the fourth listener, we thank you for the support. Be sure to sign up at login.dogmadebate.com and take advantage of your fourth listener status. What about Fräulein Freisel in Austria, whose father kept her in a dungeon where she didn't see daylight for 24 years and came down most nights to rape and to sodomize her, often in front of the children? Imagine how she must have begged him. Imagine how she must have pleaded. Imagine for how long. Imagine how she must have prayed every day, how she must have beseeched heaven. Imagine, for 24 years, and no, no answer at all. Nothing. Nothing. Now, you say that's all right that she went through that because she'll get a better deal in another life. I have to ask you if you, if you can be morally or ethically serious and postulate such a question. No, nope, that had to happen. And heaven did watch it with indifference because it knows that that score will later on be settled. So it was well worth the going through it. She'll have a better time next time. I don't see how you can look anyone, anyone in the face or live with yourself and say anything so hideously, wickedly immoral as that or even imply it. Here's an excerpt from The Mormons, The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion by David Fitzgerald. The Oslings also found that in addition, the church also owns a surprisingly large amount of lucrative commercial investments, managed mostly through its Deseret Management Corporation. These holdings bring in another estimated $600 million annually. They include an estimated $6 billion or more in stock and bonds, several insurance companies including Beneficial Life, a company with $16 billion in insurance and assets of $1.6 billion, media holdings including Bonneville International Corporations, which owns a chain of 25 radio stations, seventh largest in the country, a television station, and other media operations. Hawaii Reserves, which manages extensive real estate developments in Hawaii, such as the Disney-esque Tourist Trap, Polynesian Cultural Center, the major source of PCC's labor force, Brigham Young University, Hawaii, and more than 150 farms and ranches, including the largest cattle ranch in America, making the LDS Church one of the biggest landowners of the nation, with around 1 million acres of farm and ranch land roughly equal to the size of the state of Delaware. The Mormons, The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion by David Fitzgerald is now available at atheistaudiobooks.com. You're listening to Dogma Debate with David Smalley. As you hear these apologists all over the country, uh, traveling and, and growing their own sort of following. Um, it, it's hard not to remember the name Josh McDowell. I mean, this guy, this, this name comes up a lot. Uh, a lot of Christians who are in my studio 
reference Josh McDowell as the end all be all proof that I'm wrong. They'll say, no, 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 no. You got to read this book by Josh McDowell. And so when I found out that there was a listener of ours out there who used to be the personal assistant for Josh McDowell, I was like, I got to talk to this guy. Uh, This is going to be fun. And so uh, I'm proud that he's able to join us right now. He's not only a former preacher, but he's a current soldier, and he's an author who now has his very own publishing company. Please join me in welcoming Dustin Lawson to Dogma Debate. Hello, Dustin. How are you, sir? Doing good, Dave. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, hey, man, thanks for joining us. Uh, that's quite the turnaround, going from a personal assistant to Josh McDowell into, I'm assuming you are identifying... Agnostic. A- oh, you're an we'll agnostic go. now. Yes. Well, mm. that, yes. Okay. Agnostic is kind of feeling that atheists are probably left right, <laughs> is what I say. <laughs> an agnostic feeling saying that atheists are probably right. Okay, I, I want to push back on that a little bit, but not right now. So I'll okay. I'll I'll make a little note here that I, I want to challenge that in a moment the whole agnostic versus atheism thing because I don't no I, I don't think we're all that different but I, I want to I want to have no that no out. we're not but um let's first talk about your history um yeah t- tell me how it all started where, where did you start getting this knack for wanting to become a preacher and and ultimately an apologist well I grew up in the church. Uh, so the indoctrin, as I as I say, the number one tactic of religion worked on me well. As far as keeping their numbers going, they got me while I was young, and yeah, so the indoctrination was from age four on. But I didn't have the desire to make that a career until my senior year of high school. Um, before that, well, I mean, after I lost the after reality set in that I wasn't going to make it to the NBA because not too many five nine white guys who can't jump make it that far. I moved on and had a new career path that was kind of unique. Um, and at age 15, I began working with lions and tigers at a nearby lion and tiger reserve that was about 10 minutes from my house. And so I like to joke that most people's first job is serving food, but my first job, I could have been the food. <laughs> and I did this all throughout high school, and my dream was pretty much set. I was going to be the next Jack Hanna. I lived in central Ohio. I was going to go to Ohio State, major in zoology and broadcasting, and the Columbus Zoo was only 10 minutes away, which is the zoo that Jack Hanna runs, yeah. and we had connections there, so that was going to be that. And then uh, spring semester of my senior year of high school, my pastor preached a sermon that about not wasting your life, and it was specifically, he didn't intentionally make or make it, he didn't specifically say it was geared towards his high school seniors, but it was clear that's who it was geared towards. And I took the bait. It made me feel pretty guilty. And a couple of weeks later, I talked to my pastor, and he convinced me that if I spent my life dedicated to animals and not souls, then I would be wasting my life. So now, I do, do you think? Do you think changed his, courses and went to a Christian college to become a preacher? Do you think his his sermon was inspiring and motivating, or did it just fill you with guilt and make you say, "Well, I have to now." It made me feel, feel definitely made me feel the guilt. A lot of it was like most high, most of you high schoolers are thinking about going into business or something like that to make a lot of money, and I challenge you to tr- more people. We need more young people to go into the ministry to set aside that drive for money, and it it got me. Yeah, so it was is, definitely guilt at first, and so, then it, it even it took me until my probably my sophomore year of college when I finally truly embraced. Like I was a I, I was afraid to get up and talk in front of people. And so I was like, this doesn't make sense. But my sophomore year of college, I started doing some preaching and then got in front of a really big crowd, the entire campus. And after that, some people came up to me and said, you, you, have, a, you have a very unique gift. And one person said, I think you're going to be the next Billy Graham. And that, that kind of sealed it for me. I was like, I got it. This is it. This is that unique gift that I got as a communicator. I was a mediocre athlete, mediocre artist in high school, but public speaking was my thing and it kind of from there my confidence just grew and I spent four years of college memorizing most of the New Testament and then but towards the end of my junior year beginning of my um, senior year my thinking changed from evangelist Billy Graham style to Josh McDowell because I decided I didn't want to bring people to Jesus through fear through emotion through their heart i wanted to do it through their mind through reason and i put quotes around that and so 
I began memorizing all of Josh McDowell's books and found out about the internship opportunity. And I was like, that's what I got to do. That is the step my life needs to take. And so for about eight months, all through my high school, my senior, geez, my senior year of college, I annoyed his uh, selection team until finally had a dozens and dozens of applicants from across the country about a month before I graduated college. I found out they picked me and said, you sound like you're, you're going to be the next Josh McDowell. We want you on the team because – we think that you could help carry the baton. Wow. I wonder how they're feeling about that now. That's uh, uh, that, that's pretty interesting. I don't so, have to wonder. I know how they're feeling oh, about it now. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so let's take it slow. So, so you, you got the internship and yeah. so you're, are you still in, in, in college or is this more of an externship? Like you're done with college and now you're. No, you're, I, I found out a month before graduating college that I got the job and it started at the end of the summer. So I graduated in May and then I had the, the whole summer. And then in August I left for Dallas cause that's where his uh, ministry is based out of Right. Yeah, for a week of training before we hit the road tour on a, lived on a tour bus on an airplane for a year with him traveled over a hundred thousand miles. And <laughs> but it, I mean, it was an amazing year, but the small town country boy who had had a sheltered life of as far as his mind goes, Saul, the world and experienced so many different cultures and things began to change in my head towards the end of that year. Okay. So let's talk about what it's like being, uh, being an apologist and with an apologist nonstop for a year. Yeah. A, a, a lot of people wonder, is this a scam or do these guys actually believe the stuff they're preaching from what, from what you uh-huh. gathered? Do you think Josh McDowell fully accepts and believes all of the things he preaches? Let me, I think uh, Benny Hinn, people like him, they don't because I think they know it's a scam. But Josh McDowell, I very much sincerely believe he believes this stuff. Now, at the same time, Josh has, I give Josh more credibility because he, he, he never said this on a stage. One of the last things he said to me that year was he said, I have more questions now after 50 years in the ministry than I did at the beginning. And he was subtly implying that he was open-minded enough to realize, I just don't know the answers. to." And, and the specific thing he pointed out to me then was the end of the book of Mark. That bothered him, that it ended with an empty tomb and the resurrection appearance wasn't added until long after. That really bothered him, and that's considered to be the the first gospel written, so it seems to lose credibility if the first gospel written doesn't have a resurrection appearance. So he was willing, honest enough to admit that those things like that bothered him, but he still, I think he, I mean, I think he really does believe it. Yeah, he does well financially, but he doesn't make any money off of his books. He just goes back into the ministry, not into his bank account. But, uh, yeah, I do believe, I believe William Lane Craig believes this stuff as well. I've talked to John Loftus quite a few times, and he, he really believes that his, his mentor, former mentor, also believes that as well. But I do give Josh more credibility, I, even though I disagree with his arguments, that he at least was that honest with me to admit that level of open-mindedness. So what was it for you? What what made you first start to go, wait a minute, I mm-hmm. have doubts about this. And and again, I understand how hard that would be to even admit that when you're in, you know, yeah. on the on the on the precipice of this amazing career under someone that's so well known and so well established, you could have taken it by storm and just kept with it. You know, it had to be scary yeah. having those doubts. Uh yeah, I mean it was it was about I don't know, like a month to six weeks before my year time with McDowell was done. And the whole year, uh, like our typical day was we get off the tour bus like 5 a.m., get things going. Josh speaks to teenagers for three hours from 9 until noon or 8 until 11. Then we spend uh, like the afternoon in a coffee shop or something working. And then in the evening, he talks three hours to grownups. So that was our typical day. And he would almost every day, he would challenge the teenagers and the grownups he would challenge them to challenge all authority, even Christianity, because he believes that by challenging it, your conviction in it will grow because you'll see how true it is. And he told me straight up, like, look, Lawson, if you want to be another me, travel in the world and writing books to defend this stuff, then you need to challenge it. You need to challenge it to the point that you're willing to walk away from it if you don't think it's credible. But he didn't think I would actually, he didn't think, he thought I would come to the same conclusions he did. And so, I mean, I definitely, that took me back. Like, what? That, no, you don't. 
one of the principles that you follow is you don't challenge your own sacred beliefs. But I, and so I didn't directly start it, but one night, I remember, I think we were in California, Southern California, and he was on stage speaking that night to the parents, and he was just going through the arguments for the resurrection, and I was in the back running the sound and then running the PowerPoint like I usually did. It was one of my jobs. And he said this argument that I'd used a hundred times before and heard him say a hundred times before, and that is that you do, a person doesn't die for a lie that they know is a lie. So the disciples must have known that the resurrection was true because if it was false, they would have known it, and they would not have been willing to die for it. And that sounded great to me for so many years. I used that, but then for some reason right then it hit me, wait a minute. You first have to prove two other things first before that's a credible argument. You first have to prove that the disciples and Jesus actually existed and then you have to prove that they did, in fact, specifically die for their belief in the resurrection, neither of which you can prove. And then that night on the tour bus, I kind of went to bed early, pulled my curtain back. I was on the top bunk, and just laid there in the dark and went through all the arguments of more than a carpenter. And one by one, I realized every one of these arguments I thought that were so bulletproof were the same thing, that they sounded good on the surface until you looked under the surface and realized they're skipping steps in the process of being able to prove something. Well, it's and all... I just that night, I just felt my whole, <laughs> like these arguments were the foundation of my career, and it was falling apart. Well, it, it's all presuppositional, right? It's all right. it's all just, you know, assuming that this is a real thing, assuming that right. these people existed, assuming they have to presuppose several things. And then once you right. get there, you're right. It, it, it's, it's very strong evidence that someone would die for something that is false, However, I'll go one step further and say even though someone died for it, believing it is still not a testament to it being true. That's only right. a testament. No, that's only a testament to them believing it. Mm-hmm. And and you know, I, I've never gone the route you just said and said, well, look, before you do that, you have to prove this and you have to prove this. Instead, what I say is, well, then in that case, Islam is true because right. lots of people right. are willing to die for that book. So, um. It, it it it's really no bearing on the truth whatsoever that people were willing to die for it. So, so you're so you're laying there in the bed of the tour bus and everything starts to fall apart. Was it panic? Yeah. Was it you know what? It was what, like what came my, over like I could, it had like my heart was like it, it, it was pumping as if I had just run a few miles. I was like this no there's I've got there's something wrong no jo- I can name to talk to Josh and he'll 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 stymie my doubt he'll have the better arguments but I didn't talk to him about it I just kept. The last month, I just kept going through things and trying to block it out. And when we came to the end of the year, I mean, we were talking like, so what's the next step? I was like, I need the summer. Let me think about things, and I'll get back to you. And that turned into a 10-month search of me absolutely challenging everything. There's a quote that may be the most powerful quote that my life has ever had. That It's only four words. And it's by an English historian from a couple of centuries ago named Thomas Fuller. And he said that truth fears no trial. And so I took that to heart and thought for the first time, like there's two, there's two skepticisms. There's a skepticism you have towards everybody else's beliefs that are different than yours. But then there's the skepticism you have that you turn back on yourself. And for the first time, like I looked in the mirror and started challenging my own beliefs. And I said, I'm going to challenge these and to the point that I'm walking away from them if they don't hold up. Because truth fears no trial. The truth wants to be taken to court and challenged because the truth knows by being challenged more and more, it only separates from false theories. So I put everything to the test. And one late night in the library at grad school in late March, I just, about 1130 at night, I just closed the book I was reading, which was a book written by the Internet infidels on the resurrection. And I just stared at the wall for about 30 minutes just disillusioned, and I finally whispered to myself, no one has any idea of the truth is I'm now an agnostic. And so I got up and walked through up the bookshelves. I called my friend, who was a fellow theology major in college, hoping he could bring me back, and then I realized he had already walked away from preaching as well, so <laughs> he was no help. And then, okay, Hollywood could not have written this scene any better, because I went to grad school at Regent University, Pat Robertson School, so I was in that library when this happened. So I walk outside, look to the left. There is the building where the 700 Club is filmed. Look to the right. There's Pat Robertson's house. And in the moment of that pain and disillusionment, I kind of snicker to myself, my goodness, this just happened in the most one of the most religious places on earth. <laughs> and uh, for the next couple of weeks, I just was extremely disillusioned, and the bitterness was growing. And finally, 
I emailed McDowell and said, we have to talk. And I, I briefly told him why, didn't go into too much detail. And then I, about a week later, I flew out to Iowa, where he was touring at the time, and uh, spent a couple of days with him. And then finally, one morning on the tour bus, he said, hey, you want to talk now? I got some time. And so we went into the lobby of the hotel, and just him and I sat there for an hour. And I was, the, the flight there the whole time, I was praying that he had some ace in the whole argument that he had not put in any other book that were specifically for someone like me who nothing else was working that he had that could bring me back. But after an hour of debating with him, I realized all he had was the same arguments he'd used before. And that sealed the deal for me. The guy who's done more research than anybody else in history to try and prove this stuff through historical investigation had nothing else. That was, that was the end of the line. There was no further I could go. And that, I mean, that sealed the deal of my agnosticism, my skepticism. Wow. That's a that's and, an yeah. awesome story. Yeah, no, and people hear the name Josh and Josh McDowell, and they think some young apologist or some young guy. He's in his seventies. Right. I mean, this guy's been he around. He was sixty-seven when I toured with him, and that was in two thousand seven. So he is about uh, seventy-six now. He's still yeah. going strong, but yeah, he's quick closing in on eighty. Yeah, he's been around. The guy knows yeah. his stuff for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. but but the important I mean, thing is when you sat down with him. You didn't go there to debate him or to argue with him. You went there no, to went have there your minds cha- could, to have yeah. your mind changed. Yeah, I mean, this was my whole life. I was terrified. There was nothing. I, you see, I worked with lions and tigers for eight years, but I didn't have a degree in zoology, so no zoo or anything was going to take me seriously without a degree. So this was it. The military was rejecting me because I I had cancer my junior year of college, so you have to have at least five years of mission. So I had no option for a future. I needed to get back on the stage. I needed him to convince me and bring my mind back, and so it, it didn't work. It didn't happen. He had nothing, and I, it was, it was, yeah, it was terrifying. <laughs> well, on, on top of this amazing story, you're a cancer survivor as well. Uh, yes, yes. That's phenomenal. That is well, congratulations on that, man. That's awesome. Eleven, eleven and a half years. Every March 30th, I'm I'm 100 percent against smoking. Every day except for one day. Every March 30th, I smoke one cigar. That was the day I had the surgery to get rid of the cancer. <laughs> oh, wow, man. That is cool. That is so cool. So, wow. It's, I mean, I... Okay. So, so when, when, when Josh first heard me, you were first sitting in that hotel room, or in, that, in that hotel lobby, and right. you, you tell him, you know, I don't think I believe this stuff anymore. What, what did you say? Did you say, I'm having concerns? How did you bring it yeah. up? I I just I've been I just straight up said Josh I have a lot of problems with your arguments. <laughs> I mean these I know, these arguments I know that you've used for the past fifty years, they're lacking credibility with me. I need you to explain them better. I need you to give me something that maybe you haven't used yet, because it's all falling apart for me and I have no other future without this. I need to be a I need to be a Christian apologist. I mean so please. And I just went through some of the arguments and I just realized he had nothing. And this. This is the most, the line, the, one of the last things he said to me is the line that stuck with me the most. He said, Lawson, your doubts are because you have a problem with your epistemology. And for the, the reader, or the reader she's, for the listeners, that's just a word that basically means what is the standard, the, me, the measurements you use to determine if something is true or not. And I just was taken back, but I was offended by it. I was like, I didn't respond then. I just kind of walked away because I was, I was just heartbroken that he didn't have anything for me, and that's where we left it. But I was like, no, your epistemology is the one that's messed up. My epistemology has gotten much stronger, and your arguments, your beliefs that you think are true don't hold up to that. I have this analogy that I used in my first book. Do you think, okay, to lay the groundwork, I'm a 5'9 white guy. His vertical leap is beyond his prime. Do you think I could dunk a basketball? Probably not. Well, you're wrong. I can. But I have a disclaimer. I have about 14 inches of disclaimer because in order to dunk a basketball, I have to lower the rim to 8 foot 10. <laughs> did I just lose credibility to you? Absolutely. As a dunker? Yes, you did. <laughs> Why is that? Because the standard we all know for a basketball rim is 10 foot. Everywhere in the world, it's 10 foot. Eighth graders have to play on a 10-foot rim, high schoolers, college students. And why is that? It's because we, we want to weed out all the wannabes like me who never had a shot at making it to the pros. We don't, want, we don't want to see people like me playing in the NBA. We want to see the best, so we want to weed it out. So you have to have a standard that's high. 
and now take that to epistemology, your measurement of truth. You want to keep the measurement high, the standard high, because you only want truth on your worldview team. And if you go by the epistemology that I used to use as a preacher and that most religious people use, basically they have to take the rim because they realize their beliefs can't dunk. They can't jump that high. They don't have enough good evidence. And they have to lower it. Now, most people have to lower it to the level of faith. And if you lower your epistemology to the level of faith, that's basically a rim that's laying on the floor. And the problem with that is that means everybody can dunk their beliefs on that level. A Muslim uses faith, a Hindu, Buddhist, and so they just have to then not let anybody else play on their rim. I will be crediting you when I use that in my future discussions. That is so yes. cool. I love it. It is one of my definitely one of my the best his, one of those moments where I patted myself on the back. When I <laughs> well, I mean, his 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 telling you, you know, that your epistemology is wrong. Is such a, yeah. a it's 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 almost the a, a very scholarly nice way of saying you're stupid, saying that yeah. you just don't you it know was, that that's what it felt like. Yeah, that's well, I mean, because like. all all epistemology is is a it's a it's a the branch of philosophy that talks about the theory of knowledge. So if your epistemology right. is wrong, he's telling you everything you know or the right. way you look at knowledge is incorrect. Well, what does that mean? Right. That means you think I can't figure right. this out? You know. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. And, so, then, and, that, and then I realized, and then I began to realize, because he also said, like, look, if you just can't, if you can't see the truth when it's in front of you, then there's just no hope for you. And I, I've had so many Christians and religious people say that to me. And, you know, when they say that, it's always at the end of the debate when they have nothing left to say. They don't say that at the beginning. They say it at the end because at the end, I've already refuted everything they've said. And they realize they can't get to me, so they just say, if, there's no, if you can't see the truth, then there's just no hope for you. And I'm like, that's the argument of a person who no longer has an argument. And I could say the same to you. If you can't see the truth that your stuff is not well grounded, then you're using an argument that anybody can use. And yeah, so it left once me with again, a very bad taste. One, in my once again, your analogy it's 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 putting the it's putting the basket in the on, on the floor. It's right. going. I'm just gonna you know I give up. And yeah. like, like you said, anybody can use that to justify their own views. But you know it, it it's not the mark of someone who is correct who can convince themselves. Right. You're correct when you can convince someone else. <laughs> you know right. what I mean. So the fact that you can just say, "Well, I know it's true," and if you disagree with me, obviously either your your theory of knowledge is wrong, or uh, you're disillusioned, or your your you know your your views are tainted by Satan, and you have to enter magic into the yep. world. Yep. You know, you have to bring out all these other crazy worldviews instead of just you know mm-hmm. coming out and 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 providing your evidence. So. And it- it's just it's it became exhausting. The mental gymnastics that I had to do to protect my dogmas, I just it's like this shouldn't be this. It shouldn't be this hard. I mean, the truth that Earth is round. That's so that's an obvious truth. Now we have such good evidence. Why wouldn't God want the more important truth of how to get eternal life to be even more obvious than that? You don't have to do mental gymnastics around the truth that Earth is round. We've got good evidence for it. But yeah, so I just. It, I mean, well, I'll be, creationism began falling apart. And well, believe, all, yeah. believe it or not, I'll be doing an episode soon with some folks who say the Earth is flat. And I'm not kidding. Uh, wow. We do have some I mean, I haven't been in outer space to see it for myself, but I, I trust the pictures. I trust the weather patterns. and yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's appeal to authority. You're such a believer. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Okay. So, so uh, at the end of the conversation, he just said, "There's no hope for you," and that was it. Is he angry? What? Wh- how did you leave it with him? He well, basically, it was time for him to go to the venue and speak. So we left it with, "There's a problem with my epistemology," and I went to the venue, stood in the back, and listened to him speak to a bunch of teenagers for a few hours of the same things he did, and I was just like this. He's just trying to they're just, they're just passing the dog on and trying to make it look like reason to these people. And I'm like, this, there's a problem with this. And I just got, I got on the plane, flew back to grad school, and I only stayed at Region for another month because I couldn't handle being around the 700 club atmosphere for very long. So I moved to DC and worked there and actually had friends who were non Christians for the first time and began to realize that these people aren't evil or really mean or they're actually pretty nice people as well i just had all these dogmas about how atheists must be soul-sucking baby eater kind of thing or something mm-hmm. <laughs> like 
and uh yeah it was so i mean josh and i corresponded a little bit there in the next couple of years but then i just finally wrote a, about a six page letter to him that basically burned the bridge and widened the river <laughs> and we haven't contact we haven't been in contact since I, I would love to have him on the show in fact it does is, does he still live in dallas no 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 he lives in dana point california but oh, okay. the ministry is still in dallas oh okay yeah, I would love or, to have him on the show, of Dallas, yeah. especially yeah. if he's ever in Dallas visiting. I would love to have him in studio. That would be awesome. So we've got to uh, swap some contact information here, and and uh, hopefully you, yeah, can, you can give me some information and I can reach out. I, I would, well, you I would better love be careful because he's done over 250 debates, and he brags that he's never lost a debate. So I'm just telling you that now. <laughs> well, hey, I, I'm, I'm all for taking on the undefeated. So. Uh, well, it's it's easy to say you're undefeated when you're you're the one creating the standards of what you of what it means to win. <laughs> well, I mean, you've heard the old argument, right? Arguing with a with a Christian is like playing chess with a pigeon. Uh, right. No matter how skilled I am at chess, you're just going to knock over all the pieces and poop on the board and strut strut around victorious. And it's one of my House, House favorite memes. House said it memes. best. Uh, Doctor House, he said it best. That yeah. it, it, if you could reason with a religious person, there would be no religious people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, that's funny. I love that show. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I do too. I, I do too. I've, I've actually, it's one of the few TV shows I've actually enjoyed watching. I don't, I don't get a lot of TV. Um, so tell us the names of your books, the name of your publishing company, so people can find more information about you uh, when we're done here. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the first book is Christian Agnostic, nonfiction. And it was me when I was still kind of on the fence. So I wrote a book that tried to show that the Bible is more open minded than what the church allows it to be. And so it was me trying to create, to stay within Christianity, but create a space where I could still be a skeptic as well. And but I, I still, I think the Bible is more open-minded, just like, like, for example, the book of Ecclesiastes, I think is the greatest treatise on free thinking ever written, but the church just ignores it or softens, it, excuse me, softens it. But, uh, and then most of my books are novels. Uh, my, my first novel was Eden Found, and it, the premise, I got the idea, and I had the, I had the idea, what if Jesus is the story of the one sinless man in a world of sinners? What, it was, what if it was reversed, and it was the one sinner in a world of sinless people? So it takes place in the Garden of Eden, opens 70 years into Eden's existence, and there's 300 sinless people. No one's eaten forbidden fruit, and then one guy does. So it's the one sinner in a world of sinless people. And then the next novel is The God-Fearing Atheist, and the premise is that a man is born with multiple personality disorder, and as he grows up, one personality becomes an atheist, and the other person inside of him becomes a believer, so that both are in him. He dies in chapter 1. Chapter 2, it's his court case outside the gates of heaven. How is a soul that has both an atheist and a believer in it judged? And they can't come to a consensus on where to send him, so it's the first first atheist given the chance after death to believe and it count in his favor, but he still refuses to believe even with all that, even uh, standing there and looking at it. Okay. And by tell, the end of the book, you, you realize he, he, don't, no, 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 uh, don't spoil a good it. Reason. Don't, don't, don't tell me anymore. I want, I want to get this book. Don't, don't, don't ruin it for me. What, what's, no, no, what, what's the title of that one? You will not see the ending coming. Well, what's the title of that one? The God fearing atheist. The God fearing atheist. Well, wow. Okay. And, and the next and, novel, only 110 pages, is called Playing for Truth. Have you seen Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner? Yes, I have. That's what sparked the idea. It's a basketball game where there's this guy that begins, he's struggling with the question of which is the path to truth, the path of faith or the path of doubt. And he begins to hear these voices that lead him to a rundown basketball court on the edge of town up next to the forest. And that, then as he stands there on this rundown basketball court, out of the forest walks all of the founders of religions, so from Moses to Abraham to Muhammad, Buddha, Jesus, and on and on, their team faith. And then out of the city walks all the famous skeptics of history from uh, Socrates to Voltaire, Descartes, Darwin, and on and on, their team doubt. And they, the, per, the person who is struggling with this is the referee, and they're going, they're telling him they're going to play a basketball game against each other to decide which is whoever wins is decides which is the path to truth, faith or doubt. And throughout the book, throughout the game, the different the founders and the skeptics they use their famous lines to trash talk each other with. 
Oh, that's so that's cool. That, that, that that's that's exciting too. Um, I I want you to stick around with me uh, for just a moment. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but I do want to talk to you about this concept of agnosticism versus atheism. So I understand you only yeah. call yourself an agnostic. You do not identify as an atheist. I do not. Okay. I'll explain why. All right. More with Dustin Lawson right here on Dogma Debate. Download Dogma Debate with no commercials by signing up at login.dogmadebate.com. Tax trouble can be terrifying, but it shouldn't be life-ending. Don't let your tax problems paralyze you. Call Tom Tax Lawyer at 844-4-TOM-TAX to schedule a no-obligation 20-minute phone consultation. Put your tax problems in the past where they belong. Tom Tax Lawyer handles most types of tax controversies, including business and personal tax problems. If you are being audited, threatened with criminal tax charges, or owe taxes you cannot pay, call 844-4-TOM-TAX or visit TomTaxLawyer.com. You don't need to face the IRS or DRS alone. Call Call 844-TOM-TAX or visit TomTaxLawyer.com. Attorney Thomas S. Growth of Connecticut law firm Gluzgall Ramos Growth LLP is responsible for this advertisement. Here's an excerpt from God and the Folly of Faith by Dr. Vic Stenger. Faith is a folly. It requires belief in a world beyond the senses with no basis in evidence for such a world and no reason to believe in it other than the vain hope that something else is out there. While a false belief may be comforting or even temporarily useful, it is a dubious guide to life or for the foundation of a successful society. While not all believers have an uncompromising faith and many recognize the power and value of science, we will see that an influential minority of American Christians see materialist science as an enemy that needs to be renewed so that God is restored to his rightful place in the scheme of things. Find this audiobook and many more at AtheistAudiobooks.com. The facts you won't hear in church. Hi, I'm Lawrence Krauss, and I'm looking around the room, and I don't see anybody. So I must be the fourth listener to Dogma Debate. It's a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a distant galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. And, uh, and there's a whole galaxy. It's about a billion light years away. We're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. So, so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Okay? And, and anyway. If you've been missing Dogma Debate, man, it sucks to be you. Free your mind. You're listening to Dogma Debate. Hi, my name is Penn Gillette. I'm a pen and teller, and I am the fourth listener. Welcome back to Dogma Debate. Now, this is a discussion we've had maybe a couple of times on the show before where people will come on and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm agnostic, but I'm not going to go as far as saying that I'm an atheist. So, I mean, Dustin, you're very well versed in this stuff. You've, you're very well read in it. You're certainly, you've certainly been around, and especially being a personal assistant to Josh McDowell, you certainly understand the Christian side of things. And you've come out of that thinking, but you've landed at agnosticism but not atheism. So tell us why. Okay, well, the truth is I am an atheist and an agnostic. I'm an atheist towards every god that man currently believes in because I think they're all BS, but I still leave open the possibility that there is something like that. But at the same time, you have to be able to define something for you to either believe in it or not believe in it. And I don't think we can define God or the nature of God. So if it's something that's, I mean, like just me personally, I had a different, def- I had a definition of God at age five that was different at age 10, age 15, 20, 25, and now. 
And then even in the present moment when I was a preacher, I don't I didn't realize it then, but I had different definitions of God pertaining on the situation in life that I was in. Because we we fudge our theology around to protect our our beliefs. And so I, I guess I just feel like you can't believe or disbelieve in something that you can't define. And I can't define what this God thing is. But I, I do say that I am an atheist towards the Catholic God, the Baptist God, the Nazarene God, the Muslim God, the Hindu gods, uh, the 300 million of them, and on and on and on. So, yes, I am an atheist because I don't believe any of those are real. But at the same time, I'm an agnostic in the sense that I believe we're all an agnostic as, a, as our foundation and then on our foundation of agnosticism because none of us know the truth on that foundation. We just say we're atheist or a Christian or Muslim or whatever. So I'm an agnostic in the sense that I, I'm open, I'm, I'm honest enough with myself to me, I just don't know. That's the position of humility, I think, the position of wisdom. But I will say, and then I say I think the atheists are right at least 99.99999% of the time, because I don't think any of the gods that humans believe in are credible. Yeah, you don't sound too different from my position. I expected to have a little bit of a debate with you, but I, I guess we the can only... Have, we can, I, I, I can I, play the devil's advocate. No, 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 no. I, I guess <laughs> I, I, just, I just think the, the issue is, like, if someone were to ask you, what are your religious beliefs, you use the word agnostic, and you just stop there right. unless you're pushed further. And right. that's what I would disagree with, because... And that's my argument to you is you are an agnostic atheist, as am right. I, because right. because the word agnostic just deals with knowledge. Right. right. So I'm, right. I'm I understand that I am without all of the knowledge necessary and I'm fine with that. Everybody is. He, Christians are, too. They're all every we're all agnostic when it comes to some level of knowledge, because none of us have all the knowledge of the universe. That's fine. But agnostic also tends to mean in the middle like that people will call Dr. Pepper the agnostic cola because it, it right, does right, you know right. it's not Pepsi or Coke or any of that it's kind of this this sweet tasting beverage that's not really a spicy sort of cola uh and that's why do you know Dr. Pepper's two biggest customers it's Pepsi and Coca-Cola because when <laughs> when 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 Pepsi wants to get the big deal to go into major chain restaurants, they do a deal a licensing deal with Dr Pepper and take them with them. And Coca Cola is doing the same thing. So Coca Cola and Pepsi are battling to have you know the most restaurants, the Chili's, the Applebee's, all these chain restaurants, and they all want to be able to include Dr Pepper in their in their branding. So Dr Pepper goes, we're the agnostic. We don't care. Mm. Uh, I've worked mm -hmm. for several companies. My my specialty back in the day was. Uh, IT, specifically mobility infrastructure, and I was an architect for, for developing mobile infrastructure, and we always called ourselves carrier agnostic, meaning I, we're not in bed with Sprint or AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon. Uh, whoever your carrier has, we can make it work. Uh, or Sorry, wh wh whatever carrier you have, we can make it work with our system because we're carrier agnostic. We stay out of that. And so by calling right. yourself agnostic as the primary label, it, it gives the appearance that you don't have a voice in it, that you don't have an opinion in it, that you don't care, well, that you're apathetic. That, that's what that's what the term I, I, term agnostic gets a bad rap because most people I say that to a person and they're like, oh, so you're just kind of apathetic about it. Like, no, 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 no. The exact opposite. I'm just honest enough to admit I don't know, but I have great conviction in my position of not knowing, in my position of open mindedness, and I will challenge. I challenge dogma just as much, if not more, than most atheists. Right, but why not? But why I'm, not call yourself an atheist who is open-minded about there being stuff out there? Because that's my the, the way I do it. Is I mm -hmm. say, yeah, I'm I'm an atheist, and you are mm -hmm. too. You you said you're an atheist because, and it's not mm -hmm. I'm an atheist when it comes to no no no. You're an atheist because you do not have a belief in a specific theism. You you are without a theism. That's what atheist means. You you lack that belief. Now, when it comes to do you know for a fact there's nothing out there? Well, no. Well, then you're an agnostic atheist. But that, that right. doesn't mean that you can't identify as an atheist. And, and honestly, it makes it seem like you're distancing yourselves from atheists or that somehow you take the position that atheists claim knowledge we don't claim to have. This, I'm, transi I'm in transition. Okay, David Silverman has helped me 
in transition. And Frank Zindler is a good friend of mine who lives in Columbus. Hey, Frank I, Zindler. And, hey, hold on. Frank Zindler is the man. He he was my mentor is, into all of this. Yeah, life. I yeah I stayed. I just I stayed at his place. I'm in D.C. right now. I flew here yesterday. I stayed at his place last the, the night before last. Cause, awesome. Yeah, the man is. I, I looked him up a few years ago. I was like, I need someone, a Josh McDowell type person on this side. Yep. No. He was my he yeah. was my Josh McDowell on this side. Frank Frank is yeah. the man for sure. He he's forgotten more than I could ever know. Exactly. <laughs> in in multiple languages, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thirty different languages. Yeah. yeah definitely. There's this story. I know. I know. We're a little. I'll get back real quick. But this this story where he he spent like all summer teaching in Europe in like eight different languages, and then he came back to America to his professorship, and his first day in class, he forgot how to speak English, <laughs> and so he had to go outside and count to like a hundred. To get himself, because all he, had, he he'd been having all these other languages going through his head, he'd forgotten English for him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that does not surprise me. Yeah. Oh man! But but no, like I said, I am, and now I even say, hey, if I'm in a debate with a Christian or Muslim, I say you're an atheist too, because I, I use the Dawkins argument. Like, look, you don't believe in 99.9 percent of the gods out there, so you're an atheist, just like most. You're you're almost as much an atheist as David Silverman is. And so I say, so I, yeah, I now use the term that I'm an, an atheist. Because cool. I don't believe in any of the religions. Very cool. Yeah, yeah and, and also it's important to show that we're not divided. You know, it's important right. to embrace no, that. Agree. It's important to embrace the, the label. And, and Dave Silverman, you know, we don't agree on, on everything, but I love the guy to death. And he makes a good point. I just think I would use different words to make his point. Well, because we're different mm-hmm. human beings, that's okay. Um, but as a matter of fact, we just did an audio book together that's about to come out. We, we both recorded Dan Errol's audio book. Um, I, I love Dave, uh, but he, you know, whenever he's making these arguments that, you know, don't, you know, I've, I've heard him before say, oh, you're not a humanist, you're an atheist, you're not a right. yeah, agnostic, you're an atheist. I, I, I'm fine with people embracing all of those labels. I'm, I'm fine with saying I'm a humanist and I'm fine with saying I'm, uh, agnostic when it comes to knowledge. But I do agree with Dave that we need to help normalize this concept of atheism yeah. so that people don't look yeah. at us as, you know, the, the, the people with black fingernails with our right. hoods on in right. the corner with pitchforks because they don't, they just don't understand. So, you know, right. speaking up and saying I'm atheist helps to normalize people. Go, oh wait, but you're such a good guy. Exactly. You right. know what? The fact that I think this is my only chance on earth um, makes it very right. important that my interactions with you are positive because mm-hmm. when I'm gone, I'm not going to a heaven. I'm only going to live on right. in your memories by how I interacted well, with you. And that means the world to me. So I don't want to affect you negatively. Right. And I've had people well, before, Sam like, Harris, he, oh, sorry, I've had people before, you know, at the cash register who will overcharge or uh, undercharge me for something. And I'll say, Oh, actually you didn't charge me for this second drink or this second thing. And they'll right. go, Oh wow! Thank you. I didn't even realize. And then, as they're fixing the mistake, they'll say, "So you must be a Christian." No, no, no. They'll usually say something like, "Wow, most people wouldn't say anything." Thank you so much. They won't even bring up religion, but I will. I'll say, "Well, I'm an atheist, and I feel like this is my only shot on earth, and I don't want to screw right. it up." And they're like, "What? Like this is weird? What? Your atheism is the cause of you doing something good? Well, not really. My humanism is what drives me to do something right. good." But my atheism informs that viewpoint, and that's what makes me want to be a good person, is the fact that I know this is my only shot at it. So saying, well, I'm agnostic whenever you're you know, offered the opportunity to say atheism, for one, we lose a chance to help normalize atheism. For two, it somewhat divides us by people going, oh, you don't identify with those crazy atheists either. And three, they're thinking, you're in the middle. There's still hope for you. So that's why I discourage people from using that term no, until you no, get into discussions like this. Months, I've, I've, I've began using both terms. Good. As long as I have the opportunity to, ex- to, have, to explain to them what I've said to you. All right, well, Dustin, man, it's been great uh, being in touch with you, and, and I know you're traveling. I know you're you're deploying soon. Thank you for your service uh, to our no, to our protection definitely. and to our to our government. Um, we definitely appreciate you for that. And look, let's stay in touch. I, I want to have you back uh, whenever you're back in town, and uh, yeah, definitely, definitely need to get and that he, contact. Yeah, hey, you know what? I mean, I'm the public affairs officer for the. So media relations is my thing all over there. So if we if you want to be in contact, we can do. I can Skype one in from over there. It's not a problem. This, this is what I might cool. do full time. That is so cool. Awesome. Well, Dustin, thank you so much, folks. Please go check it out. Are these books on Amazon? Uh, yes, they are. And Caged Lions Publishing is the name of my publishing company. I went. I mean, used to be a lion and tiger trainer, and so the the quote that I go with it is: every book is a caged animal restlessly waiting for someone to open it up and let it out, let its message out. 
Check out his book, Christian Agnostic and the God-Fearing Atheist. And, of course, uh, what is it, Playing for Truth, right? Was Playing that... for Truth, and there's a political one that came out that's called The Ghost of Democracy, Where the White House is Haunted. Oh, that's the last one. <laughs> These things sound so interesting. Dustin, thanks so much for your time today. All right. Thanks, Dave. If you're the fourth listener, we thank you for the support. Be sure to sign up at login.dogmadebate.com and take advantage of your fourth listener status.